and welcome history buffs! My name is Nick Hodges and today we'll be taking a look at Gladiator. Now just a heads up, I would like you to know that I do indeed love this movie, but when it comes to history, it's about as accurate as an episode from Game of Thrones. I will hurt you for this. Anyway, in the story of Gladiator, the Roman general Maximus is betrayed by the evil Emperor Commodus. His family is murdered and he becomes a slave and then sold off to become a gladiator. It's a great story of revenge, but the character of Maximus is entirely made up. Although he's very well written, Maximus is more of a plot device to allow the audience to experience the greatest aspects of Roman life. Its army, its senate, its system of slavery, and of course, its very epicenter of Roman culture, the Colosseum. This is Gladiator. The year is 180 AD and Rome is at the very peak of its golden age. It governs the lives of over a quarter of the world's population and its mighty empire stretches from the forests of northern England to the deserts and great cities of Egypt in the Middle East. For the most part there is peace and prosperity throughout the empire, but it's one that will not last. Rome is at the extent of its power and influence. It has been 63 years since the Empire's last territorial expansion. Its armies now focus solely on protecting its borders against barbarian invasions. The Emperor, Marcus Aurelius, has been fighting a series of bloody wars against the Germanic tribes along the River Danube. Much beloved by his people, he is generally considered today as one of the last great emperors of Rome, and his leadership was definitely tested during these conflicts. This is because these weren't the same barbarians Rome had successfully defeated in the past. They had learnt a thing or two from their Roman oppressors since the time of Augustus. By now they were highly organised and equally ferocious. Uh, why does that chant sound so familiar? No. Oh. Huh. However, Marcus Aurelius was able to rise up to the challenge of protecting Rome's frontier during the Marcomannic Wars. Aside from being a great general, he was also a philosopher and extremely intelligent. Using his cunning, he was able to isolate and destroy each tribe individually before moving on to the next. This took him over 10 years of his life, but it was ultimately successful. And Richard Harris generally does a good job at portraying Marcus Aurelius. We get the sense of a man weathered by decades of war. Highly intelligent, yes, but magnanimous in his humility. Do you see that map, Maximus? That is the world which I create. Wait, what? For 25 years, I have conquered, spilt blood, expanded the empire. Oh, really? That that map? You conquered all of that? <laughs> wow, the ego on this guy! Don't you think you're laying it on a bit thick, mate? Expanded the empire? You expanded jack shit! The last emperor to expand the empire was Trajan, and I really doubt that he would take credit for the rest of it as well. This is a pleasant fiction, isn't it? Anyway, the movie begins on what was the final battle of these long wars. At the Battle of Lagorizio in modern day Slovakia, the film does a great job at authentically portraying how the Roman war machine worked. In open battle, Roman armies were unstoppable. Using the latest technology of ballistas and onagers, as well as years of training, they were able to crush any opponent in the field. It was through these very tactics that allowed the Romans to emerge victorious time and time again. People should know when they're conquered. When the battle is over, Marcus Aurelius summons his son Commodus to the front, and this is where the rest of the movie, how can I say this, um, detours away from actual history. Are you ready to do your duty for Rome? Yes, father. You will not be emperor. Which wise are all the man is to take my place? My paws. We'll pass to Maximus. 
to hold in trust until the Senate is ready to rule once more. Rome is to be a republic again. Although this is an important scene and provides the necessary catalyst for the rest of the movie, in reality there was never any question as to whether Commodus would become emperor. In fact, it was Marcus Aurelius who reinstated the succession by male heir policy that all his predecessors had abandoned. To prepare Commodus, Marcus Aurelius brought him on his campaigns against the barbarians at a very young age to school him on the lessons of war and ruling the people for much of his childhood. At the age of just 15, Commodus became joint emperor with his father. So, knowing all of that, this scene takes a total turn when Marcus Aurelius says, My decision disappoints you? Fuck yeah, it disappoints him! You made him spend his whole childhood preparing for this, only to take it away at the last possible second? You're the cruelest parent imaginable, no wonder he fucking hates you so much. You're a crook. You're a cheat and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster! So when the real Marcus Aurelius finally died in 180 AD, Commodus became sole emperor at the age of 19. Despite everything his father had prepared him for, Commodus had no interest in pursuing his father's vision for Rome. In that same year, he brought the campaigns along the Danube to an abrupt halt and negotiated a weak peace treaty with the barbarian tribes. He returned to Rome and organized a triumph in his own personal honor. His primary concern from that moment on was to enjoy himself as much as possible and leave the running of the government to more interested people. As to why he did it, well think about it. If you spent your whole childhood being dragged off to campaigns by your dad and then at the age of 19 you become the most powerful man on earth. Well, you only need to look at examples of rich trust fund brats today inheriting their daddy's millions times that by a thousand and you get a good idea of what Commodus's reign was like. The gladiatorial games were the most popular form of entertainment in the Roman world. They're probably the perfect representation of Roman values. The courage to face mortal combat, that contempt for death, and the courage it takes to meet it honorably in the end. If a gladiator lost and was sentenced to die, it was up to him to show the crowd how to die like a Roman. It can't be stated enough how seriously Romans took these games and the amount of preparation that went into their execution is literally unbelievable. The movie Gladiator is one of the few examples where they actually toned down how ridiculous these games would get. The Colosseum, the largest amphitheater in the world, was able to seat 50,000 people, host a variety of spectacles such as gladiatorial bouts, animal hunts, reenactments of famous battles, and most incredibly, they would flood the arena and have actual sea battles in them. Sometimes this would all be within the same week. Although in today's standards this is completely horrific and alien to us, you have to understand that back then, Romans were exposed to death all the time. Whether it be through disease, public executions, or sometimes even war. So it's not really surprising that they had such a fascination with death. And the Colosseum was the perfect way in which to see it. And since gladiators were favoured amongst all other forms of entertainment, they were also prepared for that same level of professionalism. In the movie, the gladiators are randomly picked slaves with no real purpose other than to die in the arena and with very little care provided in their training and selection. Why don't you fight? We all have to fight. Well, I don't fight. Shouldn't be here, I'm a scribe. I write down words and speak seven languages. Good. Tomorrow you can scream in seven languages. The games themselves are completely chaotic where gladiators are literally thrown into the arena and the fight simply becomes a free-for-all. In reality, the Romans would have viewed the games in the movie as very unsportsmanlike if that makes sense. 
Slaves who were chosen to become gladiators were always in perfect physical condition. They would then undergo months of rigorous training to hone their fighting skills, and when they weren't training they would be well fed and be pampered by Roman baths and massages. It's quite weird to say this, but a good comparison of how a gladiator was handpicked and cared for is with the same way racehorses are treated today. A lot of money went into these games, so the Romans wanted to put on the best possible show. In the film, each gladiator seemed to wear randomly selected armour, and they all look completely different than the other. There's one that looks like a troll, one that looks like a pig, and one gladiator that's wearing a bull's head for some reason, I don't know what the point in that is. In reality, the armour was chosen specifically to fit a gladiator's type and unique fighting style. Like modern sports fans today, Romans would have their favourite types and love to see how their gladiators fared against another. In all gladiator bouts, they would usually pit someone who was agile and quick against someone who was heavy and strong. They were physical displays of speed against brute force, and Romans loved to debate over which attribute was more important and argue over the tiniest of details. But of all Romans, there was no one more obsessed with the games than Emperor Commodus. In Gladiator, Commodus is performed perfectly by the actor Joaquin Phoenix, who is definitely my favourite character in the entire movie. Even though it's clear that the Emperor is a villain, we see a truly tragic figure with deep ties to a lack of relationship with his father. It's clear that Marcus Aurelius has been preparing Commodus to become Emperor, that probably his whole life has been spent being constantly criticised by his father without an ounce of affection. Unable to meet his father's high expectations, it comes as no surprise when he feels bitterness towards Maximus. He recognises the love that Marcus Aurelius shows Maximus, despite never having received any of it himself. When Marcus Aurelius finally declares that Commodus will not be Emperor, that is not the thing that pushes him over the edge. It is this. Which wiser old the man is to take my place? My paws will pass to Maximus. I really doubt that Marcus Aurelius would have been killed in the movie if he had passed his powers over to Senator Gracchus. But the fact that he chose Maximus, someone who most likely grew up with Commodus when they were children. After all, Commodus constantly refers to Maximus as his brother. The men with me, brother. Our great father is dead. And perhaps throughout the years, noticed his father pay less and less attention to him and begin to treat Maximus as more of a son than Commodus ever was. So when Marcus Aurelius declares Maximus to be the protector of Rome, it is not only a betrayal to Commodus, but admittance to the entire known world that Marcus Aurelius doesn't value or even love his son. It is these high expectations and constant beratement by an absent father that resulted with a monster. Am I not After murdering Marcus Aurelius, Commodus prepares a series of highly expensive gladiatorial games in his father's honour. In appearance, at least according to his enemies, they serve only to secure his popularity with the mob. That is power. The mob is Rome. But these games actually serve a deeper purpose than that, part of a sick and twisted grand design that has two functions. The first is to get the love and respect he so desperately craves from Rome itself. If they lie to me, they don't respect me. If they don't respect me, how can they ever love me? Do you not see, Lucilla? I will give the people a vision of Rome and they'll love me for it. You bring them death. And they will love him for it. The second function is that by throwing these games to secure love and popularity with the mob, they also serve a sinister purpose. And what pays for it? These daily games are costing a fortune, yet we have no new taxes. The future. The future pays for it. He started selling the grain reserves. This can't be true. He's selling Rome's reserves of grain. The people will be starving in two years. I hope they're enjoying the games because soon enough they'll be dead because of them. In a sick way, 
These games are in his father's honor. The only thing Marcus Aurelius truly loved unconditionally was Rome itself and Commodus wished to see its destruction most of all. But regardless of how evil he was, the audience could sympathize and feel sorry for this great tragic character. However, the real Commodus, little shit that he was, was not sympathetic at all. The great games he hosted served no purpose other than to serve his own indulgence. He couldn't care less about anything else including ruling the empire. He was so obsessed with gladiators that he actually wanted to be one and went into the arena to fight them. Just like in the movie, these fights would be rigged of course. He would be outfitted with the best weapons and armor money could buy and the poor sod he faced would be handicapped and armed with a dull blade. Aside from the fact that the Emperor of Rome is playing a role commonly associated with slaves, the fact that these fights are rigged insulted Roman values of honor, and so caused a decline in his popularity with the Roman people. When Commodus wasn't playing gladiator or throwing epic parties, he also had countless people assassinated. Whether it be to seize their property or for political reasons, there was no end to it. And mostly, it just happened at random, even to people closer to him. Eventually, he met his demise because fucking genius that he was, left a list of people he was going to have killed just lying around in his villa. It was his mistress, Marcia, who found it and saw her name at the top of the list. Marcia showed it to the other people also on it, and together they hatched a plot to kill Commodus. Now, in the movie, Commodus dies in a pretty dignified way, and I actually prefer it because, in real life, his death was really embarrassing. Now, what really happened was that Marcia and the conspirators convinced Commodus' gladiatorial trainer Narcissus to strangle Commodus in his bath. So bear that in mind. Could you imagine if they recreated that scene in Gladiator with Russell Crowe choking out a naked Joaquin Phoenix? I doubt even Hans Zimmer can make that scene look epic. Ultimately, I think we can all agree that this was a necessary change to the movie. However, its ending does not truly reflect the consequences of Commodus' rule. When Maximus dies, we get a general feeling that evil has been defeated and Rome can be saved. Rome worth one good man's life. We believed it once. Make us believe it again. He was a soldier of Rome. Honor him. But in reality, the damage had already been done. Following almost immediately upon Commodus' death, Rome would be hit by years of civil war by pretenders fighting for the imperial throne. In the long run, Commodus' reign ended Rome's golden age and his death marked the beginning of the end of Rome itself. From this point forward, the empire focused in on itself and after centuries of mismanagement, inner fighting and quite frankly growing soft, would leave the empire open to uncontested barbarian invasions before it finally disappeared forever. Now, despite of all of these historical inaccuracies, Gladiator is a great film. Normally, when a movie is this inconsistent with history, it tends to piss me off a little bit. However, with Gladiator, it seems to be the exception rather than the rule. Although it fails as a true representation of Roman antiquity, it makes up for it with its great writing, in-depth characters, epic score, and high production values. It truly seems like the stars aligned when this film was made, so much so that Ridley Scott has been trying ever since to recreate the same impact Gladiator had 15 years ago. From Kingdom of Heaven to Robin Hood and most recently with Exodus Gods and Kings. All of their trailers and posters constantly remind us of one thing. My 
He's fucking obsessed with Gladiator. That's right, Sil. As if we would forget. Because not only is Gladiator a great film, it's probably the biggest reason for Hollywood's revival of historical epics today and reawakening the general public's fascination with history. For that reason alone, I know we can all be thankful for Gladiator. Well, that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching, History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and tell me, what did you think about Gladiator? And of course, what historical film should I review next? Until then, I'll see you next time. <laughs>